Hello, my name is Dr. Daniel Barnett. I'm from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And in this presentation, I'll be talking about the National Incident Management System and Incident Command. This is part of the Program on Occupational Health and Safety Education on Emerging Technologies, Mid-Atlantic Partnership, or Pocket Map for short. This is a critical topic that we're going to present today because it relates to so many aspects of emergencies, large and small. And I'd like to begin with the objectives for this session. So after completing this session, the goal is for you to be able to describe the rationale for and the utility of the National Incident Management System. I will sometimes use the term NIMS, which is often used for short under the National Incident Management System. So I'm using it because you will hear it in daily experience as NIMS. Also, we'll want for you to be able to describe the basic organizational structure of the Incident Command System, or ICS for short, and its functional components. As we'll discuss in this session, the Incident Command System is under the NIMS umbrella, and I will explain what we mean by that as we progress. The third objective is to define the relevance of NIMS and ICS principles to public health emergencies. We'll also want for you to be able to contrast the terms unified command and area command and how they relate to public health emergency and disaster response in the context presented during this session. We'll want for you to be able to name the essential facilities in the context of incident management and to be able to describe the relevance of NIMS and ICS features to facilitate public health crisis risk communication. All of these objectives connect to ongoing and emergent challenges that we face locally, nationally, and internationally in an ever-changing threat landscape. And so the goal of this session is to provide functional, operationally relevant tools and concepts that can help you understand how to operate within these frameworks. So let's begin with some definitions. I've mentioned in the objectives, the National Incident Management System, or NIMS. So what is NIMS? Well, let's talk about that. Before we actually define it, I want to give a little bit of a framing of what NIMS is all about and why it exists. We face an ever-broadening array of public health challenges in the world, ranging from natural disasters, which are increasing in frequency and severity. We face threats related to cyber security. We face threats related to intentionally caused events. And against this backdrop, it's critical that we have an overarching framework that can apply to all of these and is scalable in doing so. Now, there are many acronyms that are used for managing incidents, and that's unfortunately one of the issues and challenges in the field of public health emergency preparedness is the use of acronyms. We're going to try to minimize the use of acronyms, but I am mentioning NIMS and ICS intentionally because you will hear those terms more often than you hear, for example, National Incident Management System or Incident Command System, or at least you'll hear it as often as you hear in the fully spelled out version. So let's now define the National Incident Management System and frame it in its context. So as I mentioned, emergencies occur every day in the United States and around the world. Hardly a day goes by when one will not see a news report of a public health emergency or disaster. COVID-19 was the largest pandemic in over 100 years, but that is not remotely the only type of public health emergency, of course, that we must contend with. And when we think about public health emergencies and disasters, it's important to have a unifying framework. And the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, is the U.S.-based unifying framework for how we manage incidents. And here's the gist of it. Incidents should ideally be managed at the lowest jurisdictional level possible. There's an old maxim that says all disasters are local. Well, phrased more accurately, all disasters begin locally. And so ideally, we want to implement all of the concepts that I'm referring to in today's session at the lowest jurisdictional level possible. We'll talk more about that. In doing so, in responding to these events, 
agencies, whether it's a public health department, whether it's fire services, EMS, law enforcement, have to be able to communicate with each other. And there's a term that's really important, and it's bold-faced accordingly here on this slide, called interoperability. What does that mean? Interoperability means that, for example, my two-way radio equipment that I'm using as a responder is on the same or compatible radio frequency as your two-way radio equipment. As an illustrative example of how important that is, during Hurricane Katrina, it's been well documented that state and local agencies, for example, were sometimes on different radio frequencies, and that can imperil or even undermine a response. So to address these challenges of coordination, and we'll talk more about the interface between different agencies, in 2003, President George W. Bush issued what's called Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5. Why do I mention that specifically? Well, it's because HSPD 5, or Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5, made the adoption of the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, a condition for federal preparedness assistance. And it remains so as a critical centerpiece of public health and disaster response in the U.S. On the right side of this slide are key reasons why NIMS is so important. First, as you'll see on the slide, it provides standardized organizational structures. Standardization is crucial for effective response. Secondly, it allows for coordination and cooperation between public and private entities. When we think about, for example, COVID-19 response, we had pharmaceutical companies that were part of the response. We also had health departments as part of the response. A third and critically important reason why NIMS is so important and one of its underpinning principles is that NIMS is intended to do away with jargon. And you may have seen in police procedural shows, for example, I'm calling in a 1040 for 2000 block of X, Y, or Z, and there's a lot of numeric codes. Well, as it turns out, as an illustrative example, in some police jurisdictions, one number refers to a homicide, whereas another jurisdiction, that same number may refer to a burglary. So we want to do away with the day-to-day -day jargon that you as public health workers and healthcare workers and those who are all part of this response experience use on a day-to-day -day basis and replace it with plain English, as they say. So that way, we avoid the Tower of Babel scenario, if you will, where different agencies are using their same day-to-day -day jargon and no one can understand each other. So importantly, under the National Incident Management System, we want to do away with jargon. And ironically, one of the tenets is that we should avoid acronyms. But the reality is, as I alluded to earlier, NIMS is still referred to very commonly. So I'm using that NIMS word, if you will, as well as ICS, because that's how you will commonly hear National Incident Management System and Incident Command System, respectively. So let's take a deeper dive into NIMS concepts and principles. One of NIMS's greatest strengths is its flexibility. It enables all responding organizations to work together effectively, regardless of the size or complexity of the organization or the event at hand. As I alluded to earlier, NIMS also promotes standardization and specifically and critically interoperability. As mentioned earlier, that can be, for example, whether one's radio equipment is on the same or compatible frequency with the radio equipment of responders from another agency. Importantly, there's a very central concept in public health emergency preparedness and disaster response, and that is the all hazards model. The all hazards model is being revisited, but it still holds to be a very useful framework. Specifically, the all hazards model means that the tools and in this case, the frameworks that we're going to be talking about in this session apply to a natural disaster or a cyber security event or an event that's large in scale or small in scale. So NIMS is a through line for all of the various types of events and disasters, large and small. 
And that's why this is so important. In fact, there's a framework called the National Response Framework in the U.S. that provides the structures and mechanisms to ensure that there is effective federal support of state and tribal and local related activities under the framework of NIMS. Subsequent to Hurricane Katrina in the United States, the federal government is taking what is called a more forward-leaning response, meaning to get involved sooner rather than wait until maybe it's overwhelming in terms of the response needs. But nonetheless, as mentioned earlier, disaster response begins locally and ideally should be handled at the lowest jurisdictional level possible to accomplish the response. So let's talk more about the value of NIMS with respect to preparedness. Through preparedness, as illustrated on this slide, jurisdictions take action. And these kinds of actions in the context of preparedness include preventing and mitigating and responding to and recovering from, over the long term, emergencies and disasters. Secondly, to establish and sustain prescribed levels of capability. What types of human and material and other infrastructural resources are needed to effectively manage an event? Thirdly, to foster a continuous cycle of planning, training, equipping, exercising, and evaluating. In many ways, public health emergency preparedness, and NIMS is no exception to it, reflects a culture of continuous quality improvement. So we can constantly improve based on lessons learned from exercises and drills and real-world responses. And last but not least on this slide is to ensure mission integration and, as I mentioned, interoperability. So the main purpose of the National Incident Management System is to promote preparedness in an ever-evolving threat landscape. And it is a U.S.-based model. So NIMS can be thought of metaphorically, as an umbrella that covers three complementary but distinct elements. And these are depicted on this slide. The first element that we will talk in more detail about later in this presentation is the incident command system itself. And as we'll discuss, the incident command system is an old element, relatively speaking. The incident command system was originated in the 1970s to manage wildfires in the western U.S. and has been around a long time. But it is now underneath the National Incident Management System. So it's a relatively new umbrella, the NIMS umbrella, as we talked about earlier. It originated in 2003. And then underneath the NIMS umbrella, we have the Incident Command System, which originated in the 1970s. We have something called multi-agency coordination systems. You may have heard of the term EOCs, which stand for Emergency Operations Centers. These are essentially nerve centers where representatives from different response agencies can communicate and share situational updates with each other to optimize timely response to public health emergencies and disasters. Last but not least under the NIMS umbrella are public information systems, and we'll talk more about that in this session. But public information is critical to ensure situational awareness of the general public about what's going on, and how agencies are addressing the challenges of a response. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be going in more depth later in this presentation into the incident command system itself. But I'm going to highlight here some various frameworks that are all essentially different flavors of ice cream. It's all ice cream, if you will, but different flavors of it in terms of the models that we use to manage responses under the National Incident Management System. The first of these frameworks that I'm going to present here is called Unified Command. So you may hear these terms, and that's why we want to make sure in our series of pocket map trainings that you're familiar with these terms. And Unified Command is essentially a multi-agency leadership-based model where you'll have leaders from, let's say, for example, public health, law enforcement, and public safety, working almost as a team of head coaches, to use a sports metaphor, in leading a response. The unified command framework that you see here can be remembered with the mnemonic UFLOP, and with U standing for unified command, that's the team of leaders who are co-equal, and they have to make decisions conjointly in communicating and coordinating with each other. And underneath the unified command, you'll see from left to right, 
There's a finance and administrative section, which involves monitoring costs and backfill and all of the financial aspects of a response. Logistics. This is not a scientific sounding term, but it's actually used often in the literature for preparedness, which means stuff. So logistics are supplies, equipment, and the like. Operations. Operations are the nuanced detail work of response. And there's actually a whole section, as you can see here on this diagram, of operations. And last but not least on the far right, under the unified command, is planning. So planning, you may wonder, well, how is planning related to response if we're responding? There's something that we'll talk about called an incident action plan, which is essentially a real-time evolving plan as the event progresses. So, for example, one would have a plan from 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time till 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time of what they're going to do, what the agencies are going to do during that window. And then at 2 a.m., those agencies that are responding would revisit where they are at 2 a.m., and make a plan for the next, what we call, operational period. So these are the elements of Unified Command. Unified Command, as I mentioned, is really critical for events that involve, for example, multiple agencies, and specifically are well designed for large incidents that cross jurisdictional lines. For example, if there's a flood in a reservoir that affects two adjacent counties in a given state, Unified Command could be applied to manage that flood with that team of leaders, as alluded to in the previous slide, that conjointly oversee the response. And they conjointly oversee the finance, logistics, operations, and planning section. Now, just as one side note, it's important to keep in mind, one does not have to have all of those sections, F, L, O, and P, finance, logistics, operation, and planning. The rule of thumb in response to public health emergencies and disasters under NIMS is lean and mean. We only use as many boxes as we need to do the job, but more often than not, for the type of event that we're describing here, for example, flooding in a local reservoir that affects multiple adjacent counties, we would probably need all of those boxes alluded to on the previous slide, finance and administration, logistics, operation, and planning. So let's now talk about another flavor of ice cream, if you will, which is called Area Command. And these are all variations on a theme. These are all under the NIMS umbrella. And as I mentioned earlier, we will talk about Incident Command, which is the framework that is even the most bedrock underpinning all of what we're talking about here, Unified Command mentioned previously, and Area Command here. This will all come together in terms of our description of it. But let's talk about Area Command. So Area Command is particularly relevant to public health emergencies, including but not limited specifically to infectious disease events, because Area Command lends itself to incidents that are not site-specific, are not immediately identifiable, and are geographically dispersed and evolve over time, which is basically a description of a public health infectious disease crisis. Because as we know about public health infectious disease crises, whether it's bioterrorism or naturally occurring. They are not site-specific. Germs do not follow jurisdictional lines. They are not immediately identifiable. There's something called an incubation period between the time when one is exposed to an infectious agent and one starts showing symptoms from that exposure. And as we saw with COVID-19, infectious disease crises are geographically dispersed and evolve over time. As I mentioned, we will talk more about the incident command system structure later in this presentation, but I do want to highlight that under area command in this framework, there's something called the area commander. There's a person or an individual called the area commander. Often area command is based at, for example, a state emergency management agency. And the area command basically oversees multiple simultaneously operating sites of a response. Let's say there's an infectious disease event. I'll make it up in the state of Colorado. And the lead agency basically would oversee the individual site-specific responses across the state of Colorado to that incident. And the area commander, for example, could have and does have the authority to route resources, for example, ambulances or other kinds of resources 
to where they're most needed at any given point in time. But the area commander does not micromanage these simultaneously separately operating incident response sites, but rather provides an overarching framework and leadership approach and, as I mentioned, can direct resources to where they're needed most. So when we think of area command, a good mental association is a public health crisis involving an infectious disease event. It lends itself very well to area command. Let's now talk about another element under the NIMS umbrella that we alluded to earlier, which is called multi-agency coordination systems. And multi-agency coordination systems essentially can be thought of synonymously in a mnemonic, but also practical way, as emergency operations centers. That's a classic example of a multi-agency coordination system. An emergency operations center, oftentimes referred to as an EOC, is really a nerve center where it almost resembles as a facility like mission control, if you can imagine that, where you have agency representatives from different responding agencies in an almost, oftentimes it looks like an amphitheater, like mission control, and they have, let's say, a placard in front of each of the participants in the emergency operations center with the name of the agency they represent. It doesn't say Mr. Smith or Miss Jones because we shouldn't assume that responders know each other. So it's the agency from which a responder originates, or in this case, in which an emergency operations center worker originates that matters. And of course, disasters when, and public health emergencies like COVID-19 are often of greatly extensive duration. So the person who's doing a shift in the emergency operations center may likely and will change over time. So it's important to use the job titles that we'll talk about under the terminology of the National Incident Management System rather than proper names and first names basis. We should not assume that people know each other. And of course, given how events evolve, there will be shift changes. So specifically, multi-agency coordination systems, the emergency operations centers, facilitate logistics support and resource tracking. You'll recall that I mentioned logistics, the word association is stuff, meaning supplies and other materials and resources, and personnel. Also, the Emergency Operations Center has the authority and actually duty to help make resource allocation decisions based on incident management priorities. So while the Emergency Operations Center does not direct how to respond, it does allow for siphoning resources to where they're most needed at any point in time. You may have seen in disasters press conferences with an elected official and we'll talk later the term incident commander and other responders being interviewed by the press or making a press statement on TV or otherwise. Those kinds of statements and press events are often co-located within the emergency operations center. And again, when you hear multi-agency coordination systems, the sort of word association is emergency operations center. So notice this is not a command center. It's the word coordination that matters here. This allows for sharing information. And the one exception is to, as I mentioned, helping to allocate or siphon resources to where they're most needed at any one point in time. So that's the second element under the NIMS umbrella. We talked about incident command system as one element, and we'll go into incident command system in more detail, but we talked about unified command and area command as flavors, if you will, of ice cream, different flavors of ice cream of the incident command concept. That's the first item under the NIMS umbrella. And we just now talked about the second item under the NIMS umbrella, which is multi-agency coordination systems. And again, the word association is Emergency Operations Center, or EOC. On this slide, we have a little more detail about the Emergency Operations Center itself. So as you can see, as depicted and notated here on this slide, the Emergency Operations Center is the physical location where coordination of information and resources to support the incident management activities normally takes place. And an Emergency Operations Center is a very busy place. It involves constant communication, there will often be televisions turned on in the front of the room to various channels and even looking at feeds of social media to see what the public is receiving in terms of information 
That allows these response agencies to be what we call situationally aware of what the public is seeing and hearing and learning about as it evolves, and therefore allows response agencies to tailor communication messages, including risk communication message updates accordingly. And we'll talk more about communication in a public health emergency as the third umbrella under NIMS. But before we do that, let me give you sort of an illustrative depiction of how an emergency operations center might be structured. As illustrated on this slide, there is often an emergency operations center manager. And underneath the manager on this org chart, you'll see from left to right a coordination, communication segment, a resource management segment, and information management segment. Now, this is not prescriptive in terms of how an emergency operations center is organized, but it is a useful way to consider for organizing an emergency operations center in terms of the organizational chart. A very important related note that is really critical when we think about responses to public health emergencies and disasters under the National Incident Management System is two terms that we're going to introduce here on this slide. The first of which is called mutual aid agreements. Mutual aid agreements are legal agreements, typically between, for example, counties within a given state, for example. In a mutual aid agreement, and these are legal constructs, the elected officials will have a mutual aid agreement so that if County A is overwhelmed by an emergency and County B is less affected, then County B will help County A and vice versa. That's what we mean, for example, by a mutual aid agreement. Emergency management assistance compacts, in contrast, are typically between states. So, for example, if there's a major winter storm, there may be in a northern state, there may be crews from a southern state who can come to that affected northern state jurisdiction and assist. So this allows for resources, personnel, and material resources to meet the needs of the event as it evolves. And jurisdictions at all levels, local, state, and the like, are encouraged to enter into agreements also with other jurisdictions, private sector entities, and non-governmental organizations, and private organizations. Let's talk about preparedness planning under the National Incident Management System. So far, we've talked about a lot of constructs and general principles, but now we're going to go even more 50,000 foot, if you will, to explain why NIMS is so important. So on the right of this slide, these kinds of reasons are highlighted. First is that planning under NIMS is systematic. So the National Incident Management System allows for not just response, but planning in a systematic way among agencies and jurisdictions. And by planning, we're talking about how resources will be used by, for example, setting priorities, what kind of resources are deemed as the high priority resources for purchasing in advance of an event, what kinds of functional activities need to be integrated, what kind of relationships between organizations and jurisdictions need to be established before a disaster occurs or even after a disaster has arisen, and ensuring that systems support all incident management activities. So one of the value adds of the National Incident Management System is it provides a framework for agencies to plan in advance of an event on how they're going to interface most effectively. And that's depicted on this slide. So in sequence, on the left side of this slide, it is involving organizing the planning process and resources, assessing risks and capabilities. Different jurisdictions have different threat profiles. For example, in Florida, hurricanes obviously are a key threat, not in Minnesota, obviously. So agencies have to tailor the planning process under NIMS based on the most likely threats that their jurisdictions would face. The third element on this diagram on the left side of this slide is to develop a mitigation strategy. What would we do, what would agencies do to mitigate the impact of an event once it occurred? And then last but not least, item number four in sequence is to adopt and implement the plan. It's important to also be flexible as an event evolves to modify the plan based on the needs of the event in real time but it's essential to have a pre-event plan nonetheless. There are different types of plans, and these are highlighted on this slide. Very briefly, 
And again, there are some acronyms throughout the presentation because you will hear them very often. And it's really critical to be familiar with these acronyms, even though we try to avoid acronyms, one of which is emergency operations plans or EOPs. And these are basically plans for how a jurisdiction will respond to emergencies based on the type of event. Procedures include things like SOPs, which are short for standard operating procedures, how to don and doff personal protective equipment, what are sort of detailed field operation guides for responders to adhere to. Importantly, when we talk about public health agencies, unless one is hazmat trained, a typical public health worker will not be involved in decontamination or those kinds of things. However, if one is specifically hazmat trained and has been designated, subsequent to hazmat training for such a role, then that's the kind of activity that might be part of the portfolio of a public health responder. But in general, activities like decontamination are done by fire services and other entities that have that kind of experience and focus. Preparedness plans, we alluded to that in a slide a moment ago, but by preparedness plans, these describe, for example, how training needs will be identified and met. How do we train the workers in various response agencies on the types of threats that are likely to occur and how best to respond to them. Preparedness plans also need to include how resources will be obtained through mutual aid agreements, as we alluded to recently in this presentation. Mutual aid agreements involve arrangements between counties, typically. Also, preparedness plans include required facilities and equipment for hazards faced by a jurisdiction. The next type of plan listed here on the left side of the slide is a corrective action or mitigation plan. And this is really critical. It's a plan based on lessons learned. So there could and should be, for example, a corrective action plan for COVID-19 response. Corrective action plans can also be used in a variant of that for lessons learned following an exercise or drill. So either way, this is part of a cycle, as we alluded to, of continuous quality improvement for public health emergency management. Last but not least, on the left side of this table, we have recovery plans. Recovery involves long-term post-event management, ranging from weeks to even decades following an event. It can involve restoration of infrastructure, dealing with the needs of the community with regard to addressing critical mental health challenges, such as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other long-term psychosocial and infrastructural challenges to create a new normal for a community and allow a community to function optimally in the longer-term post-disaster. On this slide, I'm just going to highlight very briefly the five steps that are involved in something we alluded to earlier, which is a mitigation plan. So when we think about disaster response under NIMS, we think about how do we mitigate the impact of an event whether it's a naturally occurring event, disaster involving a weather-related crisis or a pandemic. And the steps are depicted left to right here. The first is to identify what the risk is. This involves identifying potential events and event sequences where the risk is presented. The next step from left to right is performing a risk assessment. Then, Once that is accomplished, prioritizing the risks in terms of most severe to least, as well as likelihood and acceptability of such risks. Then tracking the risks. For example, if there is an emerging pandemic potential strain, tracking that to monitor whether that indeed could present a threat to population health and whether it could become a pandemic. And last but not least, implementing and monitoring the progress of the mitigation plan. Earlier, I alluded to the importance of corrective action plans, and I mentioned how exercises and drills can be very important to hone and identify lessons from NIMS and related concepts. So specifically, exercises are a critical component of preparedness. And when we think about the National Incident Management System, and as we'll talk more about later, Incident Command System, which as we discussed is underneath the NIMS umbrella, exercises should include NIMS and ICS to help agencies become familiar with these concepts and to practice them. These exercises ideally should include multidisciplinary and multi-jurisdictional incident scenarios, 
involve participation of private sector and non-governmental organizations as applicable, cover various aspects of preparedness plans, and last but not least, contain a mechanism for incorporating corrective actions. And that goes back to a comment I mentioned earlier regarding one of the types of plans that's important is a corrective action plan. So it's not just doing an exercise or drill, but learning from what went well and what did not go so well during the exercise or drill and applying those insights to improve future responses. So that goes back to the concept of continuous quality improvement that's at the centerpiece of so many aspects of public health emergency preparedness. Public information. How do public health agencies and other allied agencies communicate effectively and in a coordinated and systematic way with the public in an emergency or disaster? There is a system called the Joint Information System, which is a formal system under the National Incident Management System. And it provides a structure for developing and delivering incident-related coordinated messages. For example, the Joint Information System helps to minimize the likelihood of mixed messages from different agencies about a given threat within a jurisdiction at a particular point in time. That could be very jarring for the public if in a given city, two different agencies are saying very different things about the nature of the threat at a given time. So one can think of the Joint Information System, often referred to as JIS, as the rule book for how to communicate public information in a crisis. Again, this is the third element under the NIMS umbrella. And importantly, public health crisis risk communication is critical to ensure that decision makers and the public are informed and what we call situationally aware as an event evolves. Let's talk about some specific challenges now that relate to the incident command system, which we will go into more detail about in a bit, and these related flavors of ice cream that we talked about, for example, unified command and area command. How are these challenges for public health agencies? Well, the reality is, is that many local public health agencies are not organized using incident command system concepts for a variety of reasons. One is that unlike counterparts in fire services and law enforcement, which use incident command principles and practices on a daily basis, the concept of incident command is relatively new for public health agencies. It became very critical during COVID-19, and in many ways, COVID-19 was a testing ground and a proving ground, if you will, for the use of incident command and related structures for public health agencies. Additionally, incident command is a challenge for public health agencies because there are no ranks in the sense of hierarchical, almost military-type ranks that we see in law enforcement agencies, sergeant, lieutenant, and the like. Also, we have different terminology in public health for sometimes the same idea versus other agencies. A case in public health, for example, the word case is a case of illness. In a law enforcement agency, for example, that same word case could refer to a crime. So this is something that is important to keep in mind as we work to address these challenges and minimize them in terms of public health agencies interfacing with other agencies in response under NIMS and specifically incident command. There's tremendous diversity in local public health agencies nationwide. And last but not least on this slide, continuing education and time for training for public health emergency preparedness in many ways are add-ons. Even though they're critical, they are not always considered core job responsibilities. That has changed, I think, at least anecdotally during and as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But again, this is something that needs to be baked in more for public health agencies and thus represents a challenge for implementation. In contrast to the challenges of incident command for public health agencies, let's talk about some opportunities. So COVID-19 exercised many of the critical muscles, if you will, for public health agencies to enhance public health response. Public health agencies can leverage those insights and those practices in moving forward. Incident Command provides a framework, as we'll talk about, for public health agencies to work collaboratively with other public health agencies and with other allied agencies, such as law enforcement and fire services. And critically, it provides a structure for preparedness activities. Having a structure is absolutely critical 
It allows for organized, coherent responses. So opportunities to practice these systems that we've been talking about, including incident command, as we'll describe, include things that are not necessarily disasters. Health fair. Managing a health fair is a very complex event for a public health agency. So that's an opportunity, for example, for a public health agency to implement these concepts in a non-crisis setting. A lot could go wrong, for example, at a health fair. And so having these systems practiced using non-disaster events is a value add for health departments. Seasonal flu clinics, another example. State fair, food safety and sanitation. So some of these on this list are public health emergencies, but many on this list are not. And so the more public health agencies can practice and leverage their insights from COVID-19 response in the context of incident command, the better and more familiar public health agencies will be moving forward. 